Hey, what's going on, everybody? BDF44 coming at you with another video. So, um, got Lakers on my mind this morning. Malik Monk has been playing really, really, really well all season long. And I don't think he started maybe three games for the Los Angeles Lakers. We continue to trot out players like Trevor Ariza and, um, you know, Wayne Ellington. Uh, I, I would love to see Malik Monk get his starting opportunity. You guys know I'm a big um, Austin Reeves guy. I would like to see him start as well. But I think right now, when you look at what Malik Monk has done this year, I think the Lakers, uh, I think the Lakers could do him a real solid by allowing him to be rewarded for his good play. I understand that we like having him as a bench player too. It gives us a jolt off the bench. You know what I mean? If he keeps playing like this, he may have a six man his 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 career at some point. You know what I mean? There's a lot of good things about how the role he's in and how he's flourishing in it. But I think when a guy is his age, we're at a point where it's like, what, get year six, I think, or something like that. I would like to see the Lakers, you know, honor his well, well play, his good play and, and give him an opportunity at being in that starting lineup. I, I, it's one of these things where it's like, OK, if the Lakers are just blowing people out and, and this is a dynamic that just can't miss. And like every night Malik is you know, doing what he's doing and it's leading to success, then of course you want to stick to what's working. You don't want to mess up the dynamic. Um, I think it's all, it's, it's clear to all of us that that's not what's happening, that we're just above 500 at this point. And, you know, nothing's really working as, as it pertains to us finding six, uh, consistent success. So switching things up and making adjustments, of course, was the theme yesterday. And I think that in this case, you just want to honor a guy playing well, you know, especially when you're a team that has very little assets, when you're a team that has depleted most of that in, you know, you're trying to get something out of guys, you're looking for trades, you're looking for ways to make your team better. When you got a guy who's on the verge of being uh, ascending into another level for himself, you don't want to suppress that um, unless it's absolutely necessary. And in our case, it really isn't. I, I hate what I've turned into on this camera as it pertains to Avery Bradley, because Avery Bradley was somebody that I've always respected and liked a lot. When he was a Celtic, I thought he was the best on-ball defender playing the two-guard spot. Um, you know, when he was a Laker in 2020, before the bubble, this dude was the most consistent starter we had, and I loved that Frank Vogel started him as consistently as he did. For that roster, the way we were playing, he hit every jump shot. He defended so well. It was nothing to say we hated the fact that he couldn't go into the bubble with us. And I think we would have been a better, better team if he would have been there, even though we won it anyway. This is a different situation. This is a different year. It's two years later, and he's not that player anymore. Now, he's still good enough to be on my team. Don't get it twisted. I've, I've jumped off the bandwagon of saying he's one of those guys that we can get rid of. I don't believe that. He's still helping. In fact, yesterday, as he started, he played pretty well as a starter these last couple of days. So it's not like I'm saying, oh, my God, he's the worst. I'm not treating him like he's something he's worse. He's not. But I just see that we have upside in his position. You feel me? Now, if we didn't have any extra two guards, I wouldn't be complaining. He's good enough. He's serviceable. He's not ideal, but serviceable enough. But we have youth in that position. See what I'm saying? That's where we have our youth at the shooting guard. So um, that's 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 a priority. If I'm a Laker official, if I'm somebody at, at the top and I'm, I'm, I'm watching the situation, if I'm, say, Kurt Rambis, it's time to see the fruit in raising the value of the players that we have. It's time to see the fruit in that, because at the end of the day, we're a team without assets. So if we can get a guy who makes three million dollars and turn him into a 10 12 million dollar guy that is very good for us and i just wish teams particularly my team looked at things from that angle a bit more you know like because that's that's really a big deal in terms of developing your franchise into having these assets you gotta put guys in positions to succeed you gotta have feel for understanding when a guy is hot or when a guy is having a good season and you gotta put him in a position to succeed now, again, the six man position is a real thing, man. Sometimes you get you put guys in the starting lineup, the deficiency starts slowing, they go up against harder uh, core talent, and, and it doesn't translate the same. But Malik Monk ain't that. 
Malik is clearly showing us he can do what he needs to do against the best talent or anyone else. That shot's going to fall. He was born to hit three-point shots. Three-point shots are like a layup for a guy like that. He's a gifted shooter. You know what I mean? They got guys out there who hit shots. You got scores. You got all. Malik Monk is a gifted shooter. You could leave him behind the arc and feel really confident about him shooting any three-point shot he takes. Now, he's had some bad shots here and there, air ball here and there, but the majority of the time is swishing, man. And he helps us by making plays for others. He finishes excellent in the paint, well, well above what I thought when he played for Charlotte. His IQ was sky higher than anything I imagined when he was playing for Charlotte. And the only thing I can say is I want the Lakers to change the narrative that we've had over the last five years of guys coming here and losing value and not playing as well. I blame a lot of that on the various coaches that we've kept in place. And I think 2020, we were able to get away with our Vogel Vogel being our coach because we had two other coaches in place that could very easily assist with some of the most important duties. You know, Lionel Hollins and Jason Kidd, they suggested some things that obviously worked very well for us. And I would love to have them still in this position because they would probably suggest what it is I'm saying right now. If a guy is playing this well and your team is 500, your starting lineup is not necessarily something you need to just be sticking with. And the various things that this coach has tried, leaning on on vets that are obviously done, uh, it's just gotten to a point where it's like it's time to suggest very openly and clearly that we go youth movement. So I've been doing that for several days. Others have been doing it as well. And I think it's a good idea for the Lakers to consider going youth. Now, I know we have a lot of personalities and, and, and politics to manage. I get that. But let's be honest. Avery Bradley ain't part of that. <laughs> it's not like we're asking you to sit LeBron James. Sitting Westbrook is something we are asking you to do at times. But it, I know it ain't as easy to do. But sitting Avery Bradley? Come on, fam. That's just that's just Frank Vogel going with who he trusts. But see, I don't trust him. His decisions are not very good. He's doing things that don't help him at all. And so as long as he's coach, we're going to continue to see these issues. Now, I know this. You know this. I'm waiting for Genie to come around to realize this and fire this man for real. Like, let's stop dragging our feet. I understand we had a game where we won last night, but let's face it, his coaching was terrible as it always was. He didn't play Dwight Howard one single game, one single minute last night, and we got crushed on the boards. Dwight Howard is a guy who still can contribute at least offensive rebounds, and he could definitely play better defense than an average guy who's playing at his level right now because he's gifted in that area to begin with. His free throw shooting has improved dramatically in his career, and he can even hit the three-point shot that we haven't even given him a chance to attempt all year. It's just allowing production to sit on your bench. I can see if Dwight Howard didn't have a three-point shot because I know that sounds kind of crazy people listening to me say this, but I could see... If this was still back in the day when he would throw that ball off the top of the backboard if he tried shooting it. But guess what? Dwight Howard has literally been shooting the three ball for the last five years. And lately his percentage is higher than most. I kid you not. This is one of those situations where it's like. If if the Nets coach back in the day suppressed. uh, A guy, uh, Brooke Lopez, from shooting the three because he obviously had never shot it and then turned around and started shooting a lot of bunch one random season. If he were told not to do that or set, you would never know that he's one of the best stretch three or fives in the game. You would never know that. Same with Jonas Valanciunas. If Jonas Valanciunas had to park in the paint and was never given opportunities to shoot the ball, you would literally never know that he could hit the shot. Now, I'm not telling you I want him, uh, Dwight, out there being Malik Monk. But what I am telling you is because of his ability to hit a set three-point shot, the spacing issues that you associate with Dwight Howard don't necessarily have to be as you see them on the offensive end. Now, defensively, I know we like to switch a lot, even though I believe it's to our detriment and we shouldn't a lot of times. But nevertheless, you find yourself in a situation where maybe you have to give that up, but at least you have offensive rebounds to make up for it. At least you have opportunities to 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 see rebounds taken away from the other team and possessions going to your hands. We're one and done when we run small ball. And that's exactly what our coach did when when AD was set down sporadically, of course, because he's on minutes restriction. But we didn't supplement that with rim protection. The fact that our coach doesn't respect rim protection or that our team as a a whole won't allow him to play rim uh, centers, whichever it is. I think is a it, it, we're leaving wins on the board. We're leaving production on the board. We're, we're allowing our team to, to our players to lose value because they're not in position to succeed. When you leave a guard on a floor 
without rim protection, it's going to be a lot of layups. It's going to be a lot of missed assignments. And that brings your trade, that brings their trade value down. That makes it so that they're not playing as well, that they're not passing the eye test, and that you're not going to get for them what you need when you try to trade. Newsflash, folks, we don't have picks. We got to get our guys on this floor to play better than what they are so we can trade them for something that makes sense for us. That's really what this is about, man. That's really all this is about. When you don't have assets, you must raise the value of what you have. And it's just like, man, these concepts, bro. It's like they're lost upon this team. It's like they don't even have a clue about this aspect of, of what they're supposed to be doing. And that is unacceptable being that we literally have 17 NBA championships. I would just like the Lakers to step away from politic ball and start getting back to what gets us victories because we know how to win. And ultimately what the politics really want is to freaking win. That's what these little politician basketball players want. They want to win. Because at the end of the day, they could do it their way, this, that, and the third. But if they walk away losers, they're going to hear it from us. They're going to hear it from their sponsors. They're going to hear it from everybody. Because they failed. And it's a business. So you want to get the most out of it, right? you got to do things that make sense. And most importantly, you got to get rid of things that keep that from being the case. I'm sorry, but Avery Bradley's not putting no booties in seats. He's not tradable no matter how many minutes you play him. He's not going to get you no more than a second round pick at absolute best, no matter what you do. But if you develop THT, if you de develop Austin Reeves, if you develop Malik Monk properly, you start putting Stanley Johnson in situations where you can continue to succeed. You will find that those guys have more value than what you signed them for. I just want the Lakers to understand their situation as clearly as I'm speaking it. You don't have a future if AD goes down with an Achilles injury. You don't have a future if LeBron James goes down with a, with, a, with, a, with a knee injury. We're done for at least three years. No picks, no assets, no path to success. That's what I'm fending off with my words. That's what I'm trying to coach us out of. Put us in positions to see how to raise the value that we have. Go and find some G League guys with some upsides and develop them into something that's serviceable. Trade those players for a good player. Rinse and repeat. This is not that hard. That's the part that bothers me. This this ain't hard. I can see the path for the Lakers to lead to succeed. They just have to stop doing things the way they're doing it. And the very first order of business is to start respecting rim protection. Every championship the Lakers have ever had, all of them, and I mean all 17, have had a big man attached to it. All of them. 2020 was Dwight Howard, even though we didn't play him in the Rocket Series. We definitely played him in, in AD in the finals. We definitely played them throughout the bubble itself. You want to go back to the Kobe days? You know what it was. Powell, Lamar, and Bynum. We're the tallest team in the league. Kobe was the shortest star on the team. And you ain't got to mention Shaq. You know what Shaq's about. You ain't got to mention Kareem. You know what he's about. You know what Wilt's about. You know what George Mikan's about. This is all we're about. So, Genie, this small ball stuff, that's not who the Lakers are. That's not what you grew up on. That's not what I grew up on. That's not what helps us win. So that's one aspect of it. Can we please respect rim protection? You can't win without it. And so that's 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 one aspect of it. And then just bringing it back around. Give guys my, like Malik Monk opportunities. And I promise you, even if you struggle a little bit, the more reps those guys get, the better they'll be. The more prominent roles they'll take, the more expensive they'll be. And that's good for you because you can trade them for something. Or re-sign them and have a really good player. It's all about raising value when you don't have assets. No, you got to create it out of nothing. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to say, man. That's where I'm at. And of course, it's fire Frank Vogel all day, every day. Until we do it, I'm going to scream it. Ain't no win or loss going to make me feel any differently. It's about his decision makings. Because I, I think that every game we play and we have a potential to lose so long as he's running the show. Without help. Being that Jason Kidd's coaching the Dallas Mavericks and Lionel Hollins, I don't know why they ain't. I don't know where he's at. We need him. It is what it is. So this is this is the situation, man. I woke up with this on my mind. And you know, I'm happy the Lakers beat the Nets, but quite frankly, we beat a Nets team that didn't have Nets players on it. <laughs> to beat a G League team with James Harden. That's what we beat. If we couldn't beat them without A D, there's something wrong with us.
So at this point, I, you know, I ain't going to be all that super excited about that win. No different than I wasn't excited about the Orlando win. Beat a bad team. Good luck. Congratulations, rather. He ain't did nothing. If you could look on that floor and still see situations where things are not going right, guys in the game at random don't make any damn sense. They're not matching up at all. Guys drawing charges, playing well, and the coach sit them down like they did something wrong. Just stupid stuff. Sticking to plans that don't work. Ignoring the fact that basketball is an ever-changing sport and you need to make adjustments. Nope, we just go go with our plan. Your freaking plan, that's not even how basketball works. Things change right away. <clears throat> and if you can't adjust to that, you're just going to get blown out. And here we are. A 500 ball club with $500 million worth of plays. I ain't having it, man. I'm not going to... I will complain and annoy all of you guys every day until I see these changes. It's that simple, man. I'll give it a different title, but I promise you it's going to be pretty much the same talk because that's what it is. If the Lakers give us something else to speak about, we'll speak about it. But until then, this is this is about them making changes to help us get better. And their inability to see how to do that for some reason. You know, in this politic ball, we're relying on LeBron James. He's playing like an MVP candidate. We love it. But like I said, let him go down with a knee. It's over. It's that simple. We are walking on the thinnest ice. Rice paper. That's how bad this is. And the Los Angeles Lakers are just trotting along like this is cool. Oh, we'll wait. Oh, we could, we don't have to fire him now. Let's just see if we have our whole team. Newsflash, buddy. It's COVID year. You ain't never going to have your full team. As soon as every one guy comes back, they're going to... For sure, put somebody else in COVID protocol. And guess what? We're on a long road trip. The odds of us getting COVID on this road trip, sky high. Let's just be real. Sky high. Flying across the East Coast. Expect it. And so it's just one of those situations where I'm just like, all right. Yeah, the Lakers won. It it felt like a win, unlike some of our wins. I'm not going to sit up here and say it didn't feel like we won. Malik Monk off the bench and LeBron James went crazy along with the high IQ of a guy like Austin Reeves getting all of our off- offensive rebounds last night. Austin Reeves is about 6'6 six, six at the at at the tallest and he had all five of our offensive rebounds. While our best rebounder on the entire team didn't get a single solitary minute in Dwight Howard. So that's what that's that's it. If you don't fire this man, you're going to hear this, Lakers. Not only from myself, but from all of us. Being tired of it isn't, doesn't even begin to tell the story. It's not about being tired of it. It's understanding just how dangerous this situation is for our franchise. Do you understand that, everybody? I know you do. I, I'm more so talking to the folks in our our front office, if they were to happen to see this video, you guys really grasp the concept that we're one injury away from being one of the worst teams in the league. Because it's that real. Anyway, man, I hope everyone has a great day. And uh, I hope the Los Angeles Lakers can make us feel a lot better about our team over the next 24 hours, 48 hours. I want to see some moves made. We're getting closer and closer to uh, opportunities to do something. There's a lot of negotiations going on behind the scenes. These negotiations have been going on, I'm sure, for about a week and a half, two weeks with various teams like the Rockets and Detroit. And we've been talking. I'm not saying rush a deal. I just want us to continue our process of trying to make moves. And um, you continue to give Frank Vogel rope. Yeah, we're going to win the games we're supposed to win in some cases. We're going to lose the ones we're supposed to win in some cases, too. And the one consistent about it is it's going to be his fault. It's going to be his fault because of the rotations that he uses and the choices that he makes to not adjust to what he sees or what we see. That's what I got, man. That's what I got. I know people are like, no, don't blame Vogel. Those are people who don't understand what Vogel's responsibilities are and how he's failing to do them. Those are people who just like seeing him walk around over there and then look at the team and say they're not playing well. But newsflash, there are people who put people on the floor. His job is to do that. If you don't have the right ones on the floor, you lost. 
So those who are telling me, oh, ignore the coach. He's not the problem. Yes, he is. Because we have a limited amount of, uh, amount of talent and it has to be sorted out properly so that we can get the most out of it. And he ain't doing it. That's his job. My name is BDL44. Thank you all for watching. I'm out.